Well, good morning and perhaps good afternoon to some people. It's great to be here today. Um, happy Wednesday, second day of the NATO conference. Um, thanks so much for being here this morning. My name is Martha Heater and I'm the executive director of Plan RBA located in Richmond, Virginia. We used to be called Richmond Regional Planning District Commission, but changed our name recently to Plan RBA in an effort to better engage with the public. So. I'm really honored to be the moderator moderator for today's session and I'm looking forward to learning a lot from our esteemed uh, speakers. So welcome. Um, just by way of a little bit of background, the coronavirus pandemic and heightened awareness about the importance of inclusive planning process is an opportunity for public comment. All of these things have accelerated the use of virtual public engagement tools by regional organizations and local governments across the country. So some of us were already incorporating things like online surveys, videos, social media, outreach, other and other agencies expanded on or added virtual tools for the very first time. In some cases, the question has become, how do we take what we're already doing in person and recreate that experience in the virtual environment? Today's presenters will talk with us about their experiences with moving live events, such as walking assessments, charrettes, and brownfield tours online incorporating GIS and enhanced surveys, and hosting virtual feedback sessions in public meetings. We'll talk about tools that you can use and ways to remain nimble in your approaches to public involvement. So before we go to the presenters, I wanted to do a little bit of some polling. Um, I wanna hear from each of you, uh, each of you during this session. So we're gonna have a few poll questions that all of us have an idea of where we are with regard to virtual environment. So the per first poll is there on the screen. Um, asking about virtual engagement tools that are being used for your organization. Attendees can go ahead and click all of these options that apply to you. We've got about a quarter of our participants have voted so far. Thanks, Carrie. And about half have voted. Just about all of you have voted. Let's leave it open just about five more seconds. All right, I will share the results of the poll. Wow, great. So this is really helpful. Um, we've got a lot of folks that have been doing online meetings and town halls and surveying and videos. So really great to see. Um, not as much, but but definitely active on social media and, and comments through that. And then finally, um, lots of GIS based and public comment tools. We've got some folks that said other. So maybe during the Q&A, we'll have an opportunity here either through the chat or some Q&A of sharing some other interesting ways that, that people are engaging with the public during this time. Let's go to the next poll. This one's focused on um, challenges related to virtual engagement. So um, got some choices here and we would like anybody who doesn't see their particular challenge covered by one of the four choices. Um, you can use the other and then add your specific challenge in the question box or in the chat question, chat or question box. Got about a quarter of participants voting now. We're going faster than we were before. <laughs> Folks are in the button clicking mood. Right. It's the season of voting. <laughs> All right, about two thirds have voted. Some interesting responses coming in, it looks like. We'll leave it open about five more seconds. So if you've got an opinion, go ahead and participate in the poll. All right, I'll share those results. Awesome, okay. So lots of public access to internet or technology. Yeah, um, definitely in our region, we have the same challenges there. Apathy and low participation by public or elected officials, um, inclusion of traditionally underserved populations, 
and staff capacity to try new virtual platforms. I was not allowed to vote, but I swear those would have been um, all the things that we would have clicked as, as challenges that we face here in our region. Carrie, did we get anybody who did um, write in to the on the other item? No, I don't see anything that's been typed in yet. Okay, great. Well, folks um, are welcome to type into the questions box if you have um, something to share in other. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody. That definitely helps give uh, an idea of where everyone that's on this webinar today is with regard to virtual public involvement. And uh, our speakers can have that in mind as, the, as they're talking to us as well. Um, we'll have two more poll questions toward the end of the session, just before we do Q&A. So hopefully that'll prime the pump for some discussion at the end. Uh, but if you think of any questions during the presentation, feel free to type those in the question box and Carrie and Rachel will be helping make sure that we get all of our questions answered. So our first speaker today is Michael Helgerson, followed by Heidi Lesby Ankvik and Don Better. Michael's presentation will focus on transportation and neighborhood re redevelopment project research, and Heidi and Don will discuss a current brownfields redevelopment project. Michael Helgerson is transportation and data manager at the Metropolitan Area Planning Agency, the, Met the MPO for the Omaha Council, Council Bluffs, Nebraska region. Michael, I'm from the Omaha area, so we'll have to chat sometime. Michael leads a transition planning, transportation planning process for the three county MPO region that includes Douglas, Sarpy, and the urbanized portion of Potawatomi counties. Michael recently led the development of MAPA's 2050 Long Range Transportation Plan, a regional effort undertaken in partnership with the Greater Omaha Chamber of Commerce's Connect Go initiative. Michael also oversees the development and administration of the agency's GIS products, including the recently completed Regional Development Report. Michael received his Bachelor of Science in Community and Regional Planning from Iowa State University in Ames and his Master of Public Administration from University of Nebraska at Omaha. Heidi, Heidi Lesby Anvik has worked in economic development since 2012. She is the Executive Director of Pershing County, Nevada Economic Development Authority, which is a public entity that through community collaborative efforts develops, retains, expands, and attracts businesses that will strengthen and maintain the rural Nevada lifestyle. Heidi has worked hard to create community capacity and programs to support many acti activities locally and in the region, such as workforce development, downtown revitalization through a Brownfields grant, infrastructure improvements, including broadband, and supporting new industry and businesses as they locate to the county. Don Vetter began working at Western Nevada Development District as an economic recovery coordinator in August of 2020. For the past 10 plus years, he's worked with the numerous urban and rural communities in, in Nevada through his public relations, marketing, and advertising firm, Vetter PR Inc. These products help projects helped build community capacity and infrastructure to drive economic development and diversity. Following his graduation from San Jose State University with a journalism degree, Don worked as a print and broadcast journalist for news media outlets in California, Nevada, and Utah. He served as Washoe County, Nevada Public Information Officer from 1990 to 1993. Michael, we're ready to kick off the presentations when you are, so feel free to move forward. All right, well, great. Thank you so much. And it looks like I have control of the screen. So, uh, well, thank you uh, for the invitation. Just thanks to the NATO team for the opportunity to present on uh, one of MAPA's projects. It's something we're uh, still trying to figure out, but uh, it's something we're real excited to kind of report on and hopefully give you some lessons learned about how we've taken a, a program that uh, traditionally is a, a very important part of our public engagement, our public engagement activities uh, in person and, and transition it to a virtual space. So we're talking today about our Benson Block Talk program. And so I think uh, just to kind of orient all of you, it's helpful to talk a little bit about what we call a Block Talk. And, and really, it's our uh, slightly more personable name for a walk audit. Uh, we've always felt that the term walk audit was a bit clinical. Uh, and so we came up with the term Block Talk. Uh, and for us, it really, our program really kind of kicked off uh, about three years ago when we uh, brought in Mark Fenton, who's a national walkability expert. Uh, he uh, brought a process for conducting walk audits, uh, and we did a bunch of training of uh, nonprofit staff, local government staff, uh, MPO, and, and Council of Government staff to really have a, a base of people who collected data in all the same way. And so we've seen uh, public health advocates use 
the, the Block Talk Toolkit neighborhood groups, uh, including uh, us as part of our corridor studies and our, our planning processes that we conduct with uh, local governments. And so all of the things that we learned through that technical assistance through the AARP support, we rolled into what we call the Block Talk Toolkit, uh, which was a partnership of uh, one Omaha, Omaha neighbor engagement, really kind of the association of neighborhood associations uh, in, in the uh, city of Omaha, and really a guidebook for how to conduct this type of engagement uh, at the neighborhood level. And so for the, the block talk, it's really kind of oriented around community-based action planning. And we really focus that input on three broad categories. One is programs, uh, things that might be uh, existing programs that exist through nonprofits or public agencies. Uh, the image here on the left is a uh, bike rodeo program that one of our local public health uh, advocacy groups uh, conducts projects, which is probably the, the easiest thing for people to conceive of. This is a, a temporary uh, tactical urbanism project, kind of a parklet program that was implemented, but we've seen other programs, or excuse me, other projects identified such as, uh, you know, streetscape improvements, sidewalk gap improvements, and things like that, all the way over to policies. And so policies here, we've got the complete streets policy that the city of Omaha has adopted, but we also see other types of policies recommended uh, and come out of these conversations, including changes to traffic signal uh, traffic signal timing, uh, changes to the ability for neighborhood residents to use uh, school facilities like playgrounds uh, as well. And so our sort of community-driven uh, process, we go out, we, we walk a route, a pre-designated route. We have uh, places along that route that we have our facilitators really stop and have conversations uh, with the group. And then we bring that all back into a meeting space or a conference room to really start that action planning process and think about what are these issues that we've observed uh, are, are things that we could maybe address with a project or a program or really need policy change? Here's a couple of images from, from some of the block talks that we've done where we're really kind of showing the opportunity to maybe narrow the, the pedestrian uh, crossing distance in a couple of locations, uh, both residential and uh, in more of a commercial strip. And so as we started to uh, start our latest round of block talks around the, the Maple Street corridor, of which the Benson block talk is one of them, uh, we got one of the in-person uh, block talks completed uh, and then the COVID-19 pandemic hit and, and we still wanted to be responsive uh, to uh, that, that process. There's a lot of ongoing planning going on in the Benson neighborhood and we wanted to really get some community input into that process. Uh, but we really were left with the idea of how do we transition something that's dynamic and in-person uh, to people really sitting in front of their computer and, and what can we do and how can we really shift our approach so that it's not just all about being there in person uh, at that one specific time if we're doing a virtual meeting, uh, but also giving people other opportunities to provide input through, through some survey tools. And so this really led us to start thinking about and brainstorming about the toolkit that we normally use for a block talk, which is really kind of a people powered process. Uh, you know, our facilitators, we usually have two facilitators in each group that's walking the route, one to kind of guide the conversation, one to take notes, take photos, uh, you know, really kind of make sure that we're capturing all the comments that people are making along the way so that we can bring those back into the meeting space after the meeting. Uh, but really, we're relying on people's eyes and ears as we're walking a uh, part of the route. The total route is usually about about a mile in total. Um, or we're standing at one of those designated spots. We want people to tell us what they see, tell us what they feel, what they like, what they don't like. And then when we get to that action planning process, we're really kind of laying things out, saying what's a short a medium or a long-term priority, uh, and where on the map do these things need to be targeted? So we can we can mirror some of that approach in the virtual environment, and but we really kind of need different tools. For that in-person meeting, we used Zoom uh, and some of the breakout meeting functionality, which I'll talk a little bit more about uh, in the slides to come. Uh, but we also really use some GIS-based tools. One, we wrapped our entire real engagement sort of window uh, in a story map. Uh, so that it had some mapping, it had some photos, it had some uh, multimedia content like videos and photo spheres that let people uh, explore the neighborhood. Um, and we also uh, had some in-person facilitators to manage those, those breakout groups in the uh, in-person meeting as well. To facilitate those conversations, we used a tool called uh, Jamboard, which is a, a Google product, and I'll demonstrate some of that here in the slides to come. But we're still relying on people's eyes and ears. We want people to tell us what they know about the neighborhood from their past experience, and what they can gather from some of the things that we collected. And this really changed how we would go out and prepare for a block talk. Normally we would walk the route, we'd find great places where we could have a group congregate around the facilitator and have a conversation, kind of say, what did we think about that first quarter mile of the walk? Uh, but to recreate that in, in a virtual setting, we had to go out and collect a lot of video content, 
I mentioned the, the photo spheres. Um, it's kind of the Google Street View, uh, but most of what's on Google Street View isn't really from a pedestrian's perspective. And so we went out, used an app called Momento 360 that lets you use your cell phone and actually create photo spheres, and which we were able to embed into uh, the story map. So as people went through uh, each of the videos and the maps, they were actually able to interact with that as well. And I'll demonstrate that uh, as well. And then to record, again, using Survey123, which is uh, Esri's um, kind of survey monkey that has mapping built into it. So when somebody drops a pin on the map, uh, we can really kind of consume that as geospatial data and people can add in all of the, the attributes and things that they want to see as well. So really a different type of toolkit. And, and really, honestly, most of this was us just thinking, well, how can we recreate these, these elements of the meetings that we think are the most valuable uh, in this virtual setting? So as I mentioned, this was the, the second of three block talks along this Maple Street corridor. And the reason that we were looking at the Maple Street corridor uh, at all is because through a statewide planning process and some coordination with our FHWA division office, uh, this corridor was identified as a, a, an area where there were a number of serious and fatal pedestrian crashes, kind of at different nodes. And those nodes are where we said, we should really do a, a block talk, we should have a conversation that's a little bit different than what we would normally do in say like a FHWA roadside safety audit that's really focused on the engineering, but that there might be other solutions as well that we wanna hear about. And so this whole effort along the corridor has been coordinated with the business improvement districts, the neighborhood associations, and really is piggybacking uh, in this neighborhood in particular uh, on the city of Omaha and their parking and mobility division that's looking at uh, a study about basically about parking needs. Uh, Benson, for those of you who, who don't know Omaha, it's an old streetcar suburb, it's an arts and cultures district. Uh, this is probably the easiest block talk for us to migrate to the virtual environment because there's a lot of people who care a lot about Benson. It's a historic neighborhood uh, and it's got a very active uh, set of business, business leaders and a uh, neighborhood association that are really uh, interested in doing some interesting and new things. And so for us, our change to our approach uh, for, for this meeting itself was one, to have a public survey that was out uh, on the street for about three weeks in advance of the virtual Zoom meeting. Um, and, and really that survey was basically a link to this story map. And you're seeing kind of the first third of the, the story map here on the right, kind of it looks like a web page. you scroll through it, the map changes. Uh, and as I go through the next several slides, I'll kind of try to emulate the interactivity. It's hard to show what an interactive uh, map looks like. And I've tried to do that with uh, some GIF images here on the right-hand side. So that's what those videos are. It's really kind of a preview of what that story map looked like and how people from the public were able to interact with it. So one of the things that I mentioned is that with uh, our camera, our, we have a, a gimbal for our, our uh, cell phone camera to go out and uh, collect these route walks. I'm skipping through the video here of one of the walks, um, but we had already had that gimbal to do some live streaming of events. And this was just another application of something that we had sitting on a desk in somebody's office. And we thought, well, that might really work to kind of capture some of this on the ground perspective, might uh, you know remind people of something that's been a barrier to walking or something about an alleyway or a sidewalk that they don't like walking through. Um, but it's kind of that, that way that we've tried to recreate that walk uh, with the facilitator uh, in that story map. And so then this, again, is one of these multimedia features. We hosted the video on YouTube, uh, but it's just right there in that story map window, kind of just below the map that you just saw. So again, uh, to get that interactivity and at those places where we would have normally had the facilitated conversations, we used these photo spheres. And so this is uh, right next to a public library. That's what you see there, that lower parking lot there. But we're also in an alleyway. And Benson, uh, the BID has a, an alleyway beautification program that they're really interested in expanding, and really making these alleyways kind of cool places to be. Uh, and, and really, a lot of people use them uh, for walking and biking already. Uh, and so what we tried to do is capture some of these photo spheres, these street, sphere, uh, these street view type looks uh, in the alleyways to kind of guide that discussion. Where do we where improvements needed to be made. Uh, and this is kind of a do-it-yourself uh, form of street view. But what we found is really interesting is this app is free up to a certain threshold uh, of, of uh, data usage, but I mean, it's, it's quite large. We were able to do, I think, 16 of these on the free uh, license itself. So uh, no cost to use this other than downloading a phone on the app. And, and it really worked really well in the, the Esri uh, story map as well to allow us to, to host those photos here and make them accessible. 
so then uh, kind of that survey that existed, uh, this is all things that we had available to the public before the meeting even took place. Uh, people were able to kind of look at the videos, look at the photo spheres, and they were also able to drop pins on the map. So here again, on that right-hand side of the story map itself, we had a survey one, two, three, Esri's uh, survey monkey type product, uh, where people were able to say, well, at this location, uh, I give it kind of, my general impression is that it's a five out of 10, uh, and at this exact point, you know, there's this particular issue. And so survey one, two, three, you know, as a planning agency that uses a lot of uh, GIS data, it was really nice to kind of close the loop on that process of not making people, uh, you know, enter in survey comments that we have to go back and locate. And what we also hoped would happen is that in the meeting itself, uh, in that Zoom meeting, which I'll talk about next, uh, we would be able to take all of those public survey comments, all of those pins on the map that people provided before the meeting, all of the content that we got in the meeting and kind of visualize that uh, at the end of the meeting itself. So it's probably not the most necessary thing, but we got a little fixated on being able to kind of provide that real-time feedback. Um, but it was also a useful tool, the SurveyMonkey tool, to, or excuse me, Survey123 tool, for the facilitators as we got to those priority things in the Zoom meeting to be able to drop those pins on the map uh, and have real parity with that, that public input that we gathered before the meeting. And so uh, we wanted to have this, this layer of input, again, to kind of provide that synchronous and asynchronous type of engagement where if you can't make a Zoom meeting at 7 p.m. in the evening, we understand, but we want to give you as close to the same experience as we can, and this was one way that we attempted to do that. So again, uh, we had a Zoom meeting uh, last month in September. Uh, we had 85 people registered, which we were astonished by. We were really excited. Uh, on the night of, only 30 people uh, showed up, which was still great. Uh, we don't get 30 people to many of our public meetings often, so we were excited about that level of engagement. And we broke out into six groups, and we had uh, facilitators in each group to really kind of guide the conversation and focus on two locations. So those photo spheres that you saw, uh, each group took one of those photo spheres. There were some that were in the alleyways. There were some that were kind of along the main commercial strip of, of uh, the Benson, or the Maple Street. And there were some that were on some of the other corridors that are adjacent to the neighborhood itself. And so we had a 75 minute, an hour and 15 minute long Zoom meeting. Uh, we really were able to kind of manage these time breaks with the, the Zoom functionality of those breakout rooms. So we can give people, you know, exactly 50 minutes in the breakout room uh, to guide the conversation, kind of provide some of those prompts, those messages to the facilitator to say, you should be moving on to location two. Uh, but ultimately, we actually stayed to this schedule and it worked pretty well. It kept kind of the pace of the meeting high. Um, and what we tried to do in those conversations is as groups broke into the bro uh, breakout sessions, we really started the conversation with one of those photo spheres, kind of having the facilitator share their screen, move around, say, we're looking at the Northwest, you know, what are things you see here that uh, aren't helpful to pedestrians or cyclists. Uh, you know, what are some things that are happening? Maybe there's a redevelopment project that somebody knows about that's occurring on the other side of the street. Maybe there are crosswalks. Uh, and as we sort of moved through that photosphere together, we kind of had conversations about things about the neighborhood itself. And from time to time, the facilitator would switch back to Jamboard, which you're seeing here on the slide which is, is kind of like a, a sticky note type of a pro, a program that, that's free through Google. We're a G Suite organization. Um, so, you know, Google Docs, Google Maps, uh, or excuse me, Google Docs, Google Sheets, um, and, and things like Jamboard, are, you know, are easy for us to use Google Meet for, for many meetings. Um, but this is free with any Google account as well. Uh, and what we found that was nice about it is we can lay out these slides um, similar to this where we can kind of guide the facilitation process. So we can gather that raw input you see me adding a sticky note here. Um, but as we get into that action planning process, we're actually able to move uh, each of those sticky notes into, well, this is something that we want to see on the map. Back to that Survey123 form, the facilitator would add that into the, or the Survey123 form so that when we got to that debrief section at the end of the meeting, all of the groups had all of their input on the map, all of the, the survey comments that were there before, we were able to kind of go through and see where there were common themes and other things. And so, this was something that we would normally do around the table. We'd normally have kind of a, a you know, spreadsheet that would say, you know, this is our short-term uh, short priorities, medium-term priorities, long-term priorities. And we were able to emulate that, really get the groups focused on really providing kind of three, uh, three mapped comments and three priority tasks or action steps, uh, which worked quite well. 
And so again, back to the Jamboard here, this was shared uh, through the facilitator screen, kind of similar to what we're doing with the slides here today. Uh, and so everybody was able to see that their comment was, you know, sort of captured in its raw form. And this really became a record then of those small group conversations. In Jamboard, you're able to kind of slide between different groups. This is a, one example from group four, uh, but you were able to go and look at group three's comments or group two's comments and, and export it as a PDF uh, and kind of include that in our final report. So again, uh, back to kind of what we usually aim for as a deliverable for uh, a block talk, we have this final report that really ends up being a lot different than what our normal block talk reports uh, look like. We have a lot more uh, GIS data, frankly, than we would normally have. We have kind of two rounds of engagement, one being the uh, surveys that we received beforehand uh, and kind of, you know, like a word cloud of some of the inputs that we've had uh, previously. But then we also have these kind of facilitated discussions that really focus some of these uh, action steps on specific locations. We identified you know, who we think might be responsible or who would support some of those efforts. And so for the city and the partners, whether that's you know, the Benson Neighborhood Association, Benson First Friday, which is uh, an arts and culture organization or the BID, uh, we were able to really kind of give them something that was a different kind of product, but really kind of more targeted than what we would normally have, which would be Really kind of very photo heavy and we would have some uh, some of this action planning stuff but that spatial element I think is, is something that was a little bit different uh, from this uh, this approach uh, in those two phases of engagement having the survey out there on the street before we do the in-person meeting really gave us kind of a, a different set of, of data points for the meeting itself so in terms of really kind of taking this this in-person program that we have and migrating it to the virtual space what we found is that we had a lot of tools in our tool belt, you know, whether through our existing ArcGIS online licenses, um, you know, things like Jamboard, which you know we've used for staff meetings before, you know, to kind of capture people's raw input, you know, as we're as we're talking through, you know, uh, when we're using it internally, we can have everybody just add their own sticky notes and, and everybody can see it all at once. Um, but it also we found was actually a really useful tool to kind of uh, mirror. That, that engagement process that we would normally do, putting dots on the map or putting sticky notes up on the wall and then organizing some of that content. And uh, we were excited by that. And I think we also were able to really kind of start with the end in mind. Because we have that Block Talk Toolkit that really focuses on what we want at the end of the virtual engagement, what that output looks like, uh, we were able to really kind of maintain that consistent reporting format and go a little bit farther than we normally would uh, with the, uh, the, the normal Block Talk report. I think from our perspective too on this third point, you know, we really tried everything. Uh, we threw the kitchen sink at it in terms of multimedia. I didn't really talk about the drone photography, but we we did kind of fly the, the whole area and provide some sort of oblique views with our, our agency's drone to kind of orient people and, and show them, you know, which uh, parts of the neighborhood we were focusing on uh, in, in sort of a, a different view than you would normally get from, you know, a Google Street, uh, uh, a Google Maps type of, of uh, aerial image. Uh, but you know, on mobile, this thing chugged a little bit. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't as bad as I expected it to be. But those videos were were a little bit long. They weren't as engaging as we had hoped they would be. Uh, the photo spheres, I think, were really quite good. That was actually one of the things that I think we're going to try to recreate as much as we can on other types of products. Um, but but from the mobile perspective, really simplifying those videos down to 30 second, 45 second types of really priority, focusing people's attention where we want them to really provide input is going to be really important. And then I think, you know, while it's a different format for a meeting, we really end up with some of the same challenges as we have in in-person meetings. There's the, you know, the access to internet as it was sort of noted in the, the survey before here. You know, for our social media engagement, we went out, uh, you know, that sort of requires people to have our social media accounts or follow us on social media or be plugged into one of our partners who did some in-person outreach, uh, but we still only ended up with 30 people on the, the night of the meeting as well. And so, it's still a challenge. Uh, you don't necessarily know what you're going to get. As I noted, we had 85 people registered. Uh, we sort of made people give us their email and tell us that they were going to be there. But we thought that would be a little bit more of a hook so we'd have a better sense of, of how many people would show up. We're very happy with 30, but uh, 85 would have been a lot a lot more exciting, I think. And so with that, you know, we still end up with some of the same challenges as, as in-person engagement. But at the same time, we're, we're really hopeful that this is going to be a, a good piece of how we do this program in the future, really learning from the online survey tools and some of the multimedia content we think will help us uh, carry those efforts forward into the future as well. 
And so with that, that's uh, all I have. Uh, but I'm excited to hear the discussion. I'm excited to hear uh, what everyone else is doing on this virtual engagement. And thanks again to the NATO team for the opportunity to share a little bit about our program. Thank you so much, Michael. I was taking some pretty fast and furious notes there to be able to pass along some of those tools. Really exciting stuff. And congratulations to the, all the work that you've done. I think um, getting anyone to come and, and especially during this time and participate in those sessions is, is an accomplishment. So. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we'll hear from Heidi and Don about the Brownfields Visioning Tour and public engagement in Nevada. Heidi, I think you're going to kick us off, and or Don. I'll 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 jump in, and and Martha, I'm I'm with the Western Nevada uh, <laughs> District, and it's in the state constitution that we have to remind all our Eastern friends how to pronounce uh, our state. So that's like nothing personal. Nevada oh, was, was the last of the words I was worried about pronouncing in that intro. <laughs> Oh, funny. <laughs> but we're required to do that. So the this is very similar to to what Michael presented. I mean, what the virtual visioning tour is very similar to a block talk. This was supposed to start as a walking tour, and it was to be it was presented by uh, Heidi's organization and you know, the Pershing County Economic Development Authority, and it's part of a, a Pershing Lovelock Brownfields initiative. So I know uh, many of you are probably familiar with the Brownfields program, and, and this is an aspect of that. And we're not as far along as Michael and his planning, but I think we'll uh, I think we'll match up on some things. But first, let's uh, let's hopefully set the stage as I can hopefully uh, work the. Uh oh. <laughs> the. Uh... Your arrow buttons or your scroll. Scroll. There we go. Let's ah. There we go. So let's set the scene. This is Lovelock, Nevada. As you can see, we're uh, right in the middle of north uh, northwestern Nevada, and uh, it's it's a it's an a, I'll let Heidi kind of uh, walk us through. Um, the, sure. Oh, so oh. we are located uh, about 100 miles northeast of Reno, Nevada, on Interstate 80. And our community, um, the, the county itself is uh, 6,000 square miles. We have about one resident per square mile in our county. Um, the city itself, Lovelock, is the county seat. Um, it is the only incorporated city in the community or in the county. Um, and we have a roughly about 1,800 residents in our city. Um, and then the rest are just spread out throughout the county. Um, we do have a, a local prison, um, a state prison just up the street from us, and they house about 1,800 in, inmates also. So um, a lot of land mass. Um, we are a lot of uh, Bureau of Land Management um, and state-owned federal properties. Um, and so, you know, th those are challenges with having so much land mass and, and um, wide open spaces. But anyway, so with um, Lovelock, um, which is what we're focusing on for today, um, we are an agriculture and mining community. And we have well over 70,000 acres um, under irrigation for um, primarily alfalfa and other um, legumes. And then um, our mining, we have the largest silver mine in North America, um, just uh, about 30 miles um, uh, east of town. And um, we are just so excited to announce that we just landed the largest um, salmon, uh, salmon farm coming to Pershing County. So that is West Coast Salmon, and uh, they will be providing salmon to everything west of the Mississippi. Um, so we're really excited about that. But with our Brownsfield um, initiative, we were um, hit by a fire last November um, and it wiped out um, almost an entire block of our community, a, a historical block. Um, we were very fortunate that our um, train depot did not go down in flames. Um, so that historic piece of our community was, was remained intact. Um, but it, it was a blow and it's right on our main street and it is an eyesore. And as it was burning, I called up our Brownsfield rep um, consultants and said, hey, I got a problem um, and I think I'm going to need Brownsfield, to, uh, you know, our, our, our grant uh, dollars to be funneled over to here, um, you know, and, and we'll, we'll deal with that. So then we um, started with the Brownsfield, you know, the, the assessments and so forth. And then 
we were into um, creating a redevelopment plan for that um, area. Am I jumping ahead too far, Don? No, no, I, I'm just okay. trying to trying to keep up with you. Sure. So we were we were recreating a, um, a a development plan for that burned area for that entire block, and part of our EPA grant required us to have public engagement. Um, and so in March, I had a date set for the end of March for our um, first public meeting, and I was getting ready to order food when the state shut down. Um, and so then we had to, well, then we just kind of sat back. We're like, well, maybe in a couple of weeks we'll get to do this. And here we are several months later and um, we weren't able to jump back into it. So I kind of took a back seat on the, on the public engagement and then Don came in and he's like, hey, I think we can do this. <laughs> well, one of the things with the EPA grant work plan, community involvement is very important. And, and we already had one community meeting, so we kind of had a good idea of who our stakeholders were. We had, we had some traction going from our January meeting where we had about 38 folks show up and, and do your traditional, we're sitting in the seats, you know, you know, we talk at them, they talk back, we take comments and, you know, put them on the board kind of deal, just kind of an initial, uh, almost an FAQ type meeting. And, and, and one of the specters that we had to overcome was, you know, this was the only Brownfield grant for, for the period uh, in, in the entire state. And, and, and there's the, this Brownfields, oh, does that mean we have toxic dumps and things like that with the EPA? And, and as many of you know, it's more of a tool for, for reuse and planning right now to, to get these assessments, to maybe kickstart some development that, that wouldn't normally happen. So we hope that the Brownfield is going to give us a, a good path toward, toward that healthier place to live, the jobs and the economic opportunities. And, and one of the tasks within the Brownfields was a downtown reuse plan. And as you can see, here, all of a sudden the fire comes, oh boy. And then all of a sudden we're seeing a lot of economic interest and development happening in the Pershing County area. I know you're probably aware of Northern Nevada with the Teslas and the switches and Apple, and we're really getting a lot of interest. And it's moving east along I-80 toward Pershing County. So it's like, oh boy, we better be ready kind of deal. So we, we need to have the amenities. But community involvement, how do you do it in, in the middle of a pandemic? So what we did was we took the, the elements of our charrette that was going to be the next phase, which is going to get people's input to very similar to what Michael was doing, um, get, get that feedback, get a live feedback. And in fact, we had a map already printed and ready to go to give to people to take the tour <laughs> before the meeting kind of deal. So what do we do? So uh, we had to take um, the, the, the tools that we had and then we, we created a website specifically for the Brownfields called lovelovelock.com. And that also plays into uh, Lovelock's, one of their main marketing programs is every, uh, I guess every February, you can come lock your love in Lovelock and, and couples do come and exchange vows and lock their love at Lovelock. And you could look that up on, on Google as well. But what we did was we tried to recreate uh, what I call a docent tour. I think Michael called it a block talk and facilitators. I, 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 I considered Heidi as a docent, that we that we take the tours and, and the browsers are shown each video, we, we did a video basically with a phone and, and, a, and a little microphone connected to the phone. And at each site in the tour, we asked questions and presented open dialogue opportunities after each stop. And, and while Michael was able to load a lot of things on, on his, his outreach, we had to take in consideration the bandwidth of our internet in our area. You can't throw a lot of stuff on our, <laughs> uploads and downloads it you know it doesn't work that well with a lot of our people so we had to try to keep it that, that simplicity was was also a, a, a data issue uh, so so we sought public input uh, on these reuse questions what do you value in a downtown core how do we create a better sense of place and community spaces what are the building blocks for a downtown vision and this is a, a little tip we learned on the way look at your grant management protocols we could not call this a survey per the grant it had to be called a public engagement or public input and and we kind of cleared this with our epa person first but make sure if, if this is under a grant scenario that you read the protocols of your grant because there may be some 
some little landmines there. But thank goodness we had a really good EPA, uh, Lisa, a really good EPA person. So as you can see there, we, um, this is what it looked like on the screen of, of Love, Love Lock. On the left side was you'd click and then Heidi would take you, you know, take take you downtown at our five spots. Um, you know, it was, it was uh, if you, uh, the previous, you, you could look at it if you want to, on the, I had the URL on the previous slide, but, and then she would go literally, okay, stop the video and go to the questions. And we'd have on the other side of the screen, uh, these, these questions, which were pretty open-ended um, questions that, that the people could really fill in the blanks. And we tried to kind of distance from the survey, A, B, C, or D kind of deal. And, and we just use, you know, simple uh, kind of YouTube video uh, format. Uh, and, and then uh, on the right-hand side, we use uh, Cognito Forms, which works really well in the WordPress uh, scenario for us. It was, it, again, simple, low digital. I mean, we're, we're, we're trying, trying to fix Skylab with duct tape here. So that was, uh, that was our goal. And, and we promoted it through press releases, social media, and plus we already had identified our shareholders from the previous meeting and we got their data and Heidi did some personal, hey, hey everybody, come, come out and do this. And, and the, the, what we got was great response. Um, and our first meeting was 30 people. We got almost 90 people to respond on this format, which was like, well, this is great because I guess people like to do things in their PJs and not go out in, in the public. And, you know, so I think we, we hit the sweet spot and we left it up for about a month. Um, and, and the response was revealed, you know, obviously the universal elements sought for the downtown Lovelock core, things to do entertainment, retaining historical values, uh, cultural spaces. And, and I know Heidi had, you know, uh, well, the number one response was fix the burn site. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, yeah. and it was a really um, when I was planning the the physical meeting um, back in March and just about ready to order food, I was hoping for 25 people to show up. And I knew who those 25 were, uh, same as everyone else on this uh, on this conference. You know who your 25 people are that are going to show up. Um, and so when it all fell apart and then we regrouped and we did our low budget uh you know me and the wind blown hair and our microphone a little bit wonky um you know but it appealed to people and so um we ended up with well over 85 uh respondents and some of those people were um not from nevada not from lovelock definitely um but you know people that had passed through that had some sort of connection you know um one lady i'm friends with on facebook and she's a uh um, a consultant in a, in a whole nother state, um, but she she is familiar with small communities and she wanted to give her input. And so it was a lot of fun. Um, we had a lofty goal of trying to reach 10% uh, of our population, of the city's population. That would have been 180 respondents. Ugh, that, would, that would have been tough, but I was so pleased with well over 85. Um, and, and, you know, we did it on a very low budget. There was no budget. <laughs> so it, I love looking at the um, at the previous uh, presenters' um, slides and and tools and stuff. And so yes, I was jotting those down as well. Um, but you know, it was it was fun to do it. It was fun to be successful. And um, I, I look forward to, to trying this again. And, and quite honestly, we are now in the planning process of having three other workshops. Um, and those will all be virtual as well. So basically we're able to identify our audience and then en engage them in this process. And then it also helped us reveal kind of this, reveal the spectrum of, of what we're trying to do. This is kind of this basic PR engagement stuff. And, and then, ne then we're getting their input and, and now we're updating back. And, and that's one of the first meetings we're gonna have is, is we're gonna do this, okay, we, we heard your voices. This is the current reality. And how do we go along the visioning visioning pathway? So, so we're trying to turn opinions in, in, into data and, and, and action. So, the, the, so these are good tools. And, and I've been in the PR world for a long time. And I think, yes, there are challenges to this. But actually, I think this may be the current 
new normal, I think, increases our abilities. It, it gives us new tools and new ways to reach people uh, that, that either wouldn't bother or we wouldn't have the time uh, or even the staff level to, to do this. So, you know, we were able to do this with kind of a two-person show here and, and, and get some substantive uh, feedback and I think get some traction for our future uh, for a future reuse plan for downtown Lovelock, Nevada. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Sorry, I, I was having a hard time with my buttons here. Thank you both so much. Um, that was great, and we really appreciate all the all the interesting new opportunities for for ideas. Um, while everybody is thinking of their questions for our presenters today, we have a poll for you. This is our third poll. Um, so the question is about um, committee and public meeting options. So different ways that you're hosting meetings right now. The poll is live and it looks like a few people are starting to vote. We've got about a quarter of people voting now. <clears throat> In response to our earlier polls, Devin Westbrook mentioned that their organization operates mainly in a rural area. And um, I think that provides some opportunities that virtual public involvement can help to reduce distance that oftentimes people would have to travel to get to meetings yeah uh, but also creates barriers too like don and heidi were mentioning with connectivity so we've got about two-thirds of attendees voting right now we'll leave that open for about five more seconds Okay, I'll share the results. All right, the results are up. Thanks, Carrie. So, um, looks like a lot of folks are doing remote public and staff um, are, are attending by virtual calls or video. Um, we've got another significant group of people that public, a staff, public and staff are attending in person or by call and video, and then staff attends in person, but the public attends by call and video. So kind of a mix there. Um, the next question to give us kind of a feel for where things are going is, is focused on when you think you're going to return to in-person meetings. Thanks. Next. Okay, these votes are coming in quickly. We've got over a third that have already voted. Lots of uncertainty, but many people are looking forward to getting together again. All right, about three quarters of you have voted, so we'll give it just a few more seconds. Okay, I'll share the results. Great, thank you. So not sure is the, the general consensus with more than half. Um, already holding in person in winter and spring of 2021 are, are pretty close together and then one to three months. So um, probably that depends. Uh, we were chatting earlier that could, could be dependent upon where we are in the country and, and what's going on as, as um, new information unfolds about the pandemic. So. Um, probably nice for those of us who are not quite sure what to expect into the future to know that we're not alone in that. So at this point in time, um, Carrie is sharing questions with me, and I think we've got a question already. So um, one is, uh, did you, I think this is for Michael, but let me verify that with Carrie. Well, yeah. I don't know who. It came, in, it came in right after Mike finished speaking, um, but it might apply to both, to really. Yeah, I think. Okay, so the question is, did you also let people pro provide comments online after the event? 
And also another way to expand community input may be some of those 55 that don't show up that registered. Yeah, you know, that's actually, I don't think we kept the survey open, uh, but for maybe a day or two after the, the event, but that's actually an interesting idea. Um, I know we did get a lot of social media engagement in and around uh, the meeting happening, people saying they were part of the conversation, and that's actually a good uh, point to, to keep it open for a little bit after and, and gather some of that. With this particular survey, we were trying to be very responsive on the report and get it back to uh, our partners within about a week to 10 days. And so uh, if we started with those expectations in mind about having the survey open for another a couple of weeks after the meeting and kind of continuing to uh, pump it on social media and send it out through our channels. I think that's a really good idea. That's helpful. We we kept it open and, and just for more access, but also we kind of reset. We were able to do more outreach. Hey, it's still open. You still have a chance. We kind of use it as a little, you know, a little push kind of deal. You know, act now <laughs> kind of deal. But it, we use social, and, and, and Heidi, as I said, she actually got on the phone and said, hey, have you have you done this yet? And and that's the advantage of having someone on the ground who can just really reach out and, and touch somebody up. You should do this. I, I kind of bullied everyone. Every meeting I went to, I was pushing it. I pushed it on social media. I pushed it onto other people's social media. Um, it was in the newspaper a few times. So I really just, that's all I talked about for about a month. <laughs> Great. Um, another question I think that was um, asked of Mike, but I think is applicable to, to both um, of our presentations. How did you mitigate working with populations that were not as familiar with the technology you were using? That's a great question. Uh, we we sent out a lot of uh, a lot of uh, instructions kind of before the meeting, you know, a week before, three days before, one day before, just about the platform we'd be using. Uh, you know, the survey, uh, the I guess the the story map itself is pretty intuitive. You know, I would say that the the survey tool ended up working out pretty well. You know, if you didn't want to mess around with the the you know the videos and things like that, um, you know, we didn't really have to to worry so much about you know, people having an issue with kind of the survey form itself, people seem to have uh, handled that pretty well. We were concerned going into that facilitated meeting about people being able to kind of, you know, accessing it from their phone. Like what does the Zoom session look like on people's phones or uh, on smaller screens or older computers? You know, the feedback that we got for the people who didn't participate is that it worked pretty well. Again, you know, we had 50 people who uh, opted not to spend their Tuesday night with us. But at the same time, you know, it, it did work out better than I expected. We had fewer hiccups. Um, we did kind of do a dry run a couple of days before just to make sure that we were able to kind of break people out and the facilitators kind of knew what it would look like on the night of. But um, yeah, no, we didn't have too many technological hurdles other than the people who didn't show up, which is the biggest hurdle. Yeah, yeah. Um, we were fine. We were simple enough. We, we no, no reports of yeah. problems. That's great. Good. Um, the next question is, how do you do legal advertisements for virtual meetings? Do you publish uh, Do you publish the web link, have people call in to register, or something different? Yeah, so this has been something that we've struggled with uh, since March. But what we have sort of fallen back on with our public notices, and based, this is really based on our Open Meetings Act, uh, for both states, Iowa and Nebraska, is that we note that the the live stream of our video will be going on the MAPA homepage live at a you know a certain time, um, and so like that's on Facebook and it's it's accessible from our MAPA website and things like that as well. So we tell people like directly the URL to go to um, for uh, our public meetings where you know as part of our Open Meetings Act we have to advertise them. You know this is a little bit different this wasn't like a public hearing in, in the traditional sense but so we just really pushed it out through those email channels those partner channels and, and through our website and social media and things like that we have to follow open meeting law as well and so um we this was our virtual tour was not um de designed to be an open meeting um the original meeting was and i was i i had an agenda that was posted um so it, it i think it just kind of depends on what format and what your your intent is for your virtual tours and so forth thanks for that 
This next question I know is, is directed at Don and Heidi. Was the EPA grant just for community engagement? And what was the amount, if you're willing to share? We, we've received a $600,000 EPA Brownsfield grant, and it is for assessments, um, the phase one and two assessments, as well as petroleum. Um, and we could go, then go on to mine scarred areas as well. So we do not have cleanup funds through the um, through the Brownsfield grant. So that when we when our fire hit us, um, that is something totally different. However, I could not apply for um, state cleanup funds through our Department of um, Environmental Protections without a plan in place. And so that's where we were really pushing to get our redevelopment plan in place where we needed the public engagement. And that's how we got into our virtual tour. Um, so this is, I hope, the first of many EPA grants that we will um, apply for um, but because we're having a lot of fun. We're doing a lot of good work here. I'll just add one thing is that the, the walking tour did line up where, where Heidi was standing and doing the docent work, we had a basically an assessment went along with the location where she was. We could back it up with, oh, this coincides with assessment number three, this parcel. So that it kind of linked up with, with you know, the EPA work. So that, that was kind of, and, and the EPA liked that, that we were using the assessment sites as our locations. Yeah, and it's kind of funny in our community, we've not, we've not done planning i mean we're a, a very old community a very small community and there was no planning you know i can look in through all of our records and it's like okay what were we going to do for redevelopment over here it's not been done in this community so this is really the first step in um in redevelopment and redevelopment um and so this is teeing us up for then applying for other grants not just through epa but maybe usda rural or community development block grants and so forth so we're just really excited to be on this um on this this path yeah, that's very exciting. Um, so maybe a little bit of a segue to that. Um, one of the questions is, to what extent did you collaborate with local or state Main Street coordinating program with your initiatives? We have a state Main Street program, um, but Lovelock is just in the very in the very new exploring um, session or part of it. Um, Main Street Nevada is a very new program. It's uh, maybe three years old um and it's it's a costly program um you know once we figured out oh yeah we want main street nevada you know and then when we figured out what the price tag was and we don't have it so really our main street programming is done on a voluntary basis and um, we do not have a, the dedicated um, employee to that right now um and so that's kind of where we're at with them with the main street process um i am working with someone locally though to push them towards that um to that end because she's already doing a lot of um you know rogue stuff you know putting up a uh, love your lock kiosks and stuff you know so uh, it, anyhow i'm working on that part <laughs> but it's new programming to nevada great thanks um carrie wanted me to ask and, and i want to put a little bit of a second spin on it but I'm curious of, of our speakers if you if or when you plan to go hybrid in the future or if you think you'll go back to primarily in-person meetings and then my little spin on that is what did you what what did you learn you think you'll continue to do no matter what's going on um, with with in person or virtual or things like that i miss the public interactions i miss people um you know but then i'm a hugger so okay um but you know what i really see the value of doing the hybrid and to have these virtual um, um opportunities because now i can sit in my office and listen to a commission meeting with half an ear while i'm still being productive at my office you know but oh whoops i heard that and i want to tune in you know and i'm not wasting a whole day sitting in a three-hour commission in a commissioner's meeting so i love that aspect of having it virtual but i miss the people yeah i, I would agree with that and i think part of part of it sort of differs in terms of of what type of meeting we're doing. I think, you know, for 
some of our board and committee meetings, I think we've never really done live streaming of those meetings. And, you know, over the last six months, we've had to get a lot better uh, at doing that uh, to provide some of that access. That's definitely something we're going to continue. I think in terms of how we take things like block talks that we have normally done uh, in person, I think there's definitely some of these digital virtual tools that uh, we're going to continue uh, working on. But a big part of our engagement strategy in the last really five or six years has been uh, just really kind of piggybacking our input on other meetings that are already going on. So whether it's a neighborhood association or the Kiwanis Club or it's, um, you know, a college registration uh, day, you know, at the public library, you can go in and, you know, kind of get people that are just walking by or farmers markets, things like that. That's such a crucial part of our engagement that when those things aren't happening, uh, you know, we don't really kind of have some of our, our best input where we're just kind of catching people who don't necessarily, you know, plan their day around coming to our meeting. And so trying to be kind of everywhere, be accessible through those strategies, um, you know, I think kind of lends itself to having some of these survey tools out there for a really long time and really kind of uh, really kept pumping them up over the long term and, and not just kind of giving people one shot. That's definitely something that we've, we've tried to do, but I think this kind of emphasizes that even more. Awesome. Um, I think it's our last question coming in that uh, is, is probably really a great way to close things out. Um, in retrospect, were there ways you could have improved participation rates? Heidi, I don't know, maybe you could have been scarier. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I think we did an awesome job. I I was I was very pleased with 85. I was pleased with 50. And then when we got to 85, I was excited. It was actually one of my um, co-workers and peers that was pushing for 180. And I didn't think that that was going to happen. So I'm I was pleased. I, you know, I'll just add, I think we could have hitched, like Michael said, that that we could have hitchhiked maybe on a few more people. We could have maybe, uh, maybe there's a, some other people out here who can help us get the word out, you know, but I think that's just, just keeping your ear to the ground and, and finding people who would help you share. That's, I think that's, that's the only retrospect I'd have on that. Yeah, and so as I mentioned, this the one uh, that I presented on kind of some of the survey tools was the second in a series of three. The first one was in person, this one was totally virtual. The next one that we're doing is another virtual one. It's on a different location um, on this same corridor. Uh, but we're, instead of just having one facilitated session, we're actually going to have three or four. Um, so one kind of at a lunch hour, one in the evening, one I think even oh, on a Saturday morning is what we're scheduled. And so really kind of pairing it back, uh, really kind of redoubling down on that small group format, having the survey open uh, for even a longer period of time, actually I think a full month. Uh, before those facilitated sessions and and now based on this conversation i think it's a great idea just to keep it open after the meeting too i don't think we ever even considered that so i think you know there's there's a piece there where we're recognizing back to this meeting people where they are maybe that one time doesn't work maybe they're you know they end up you know having something at home that takes them away from the computer and you know they don't want to join five minutes late all of those things are, are barriers that kind of come with the virtual meeting format um, but, you know, they're not really any different than somebody driving past that public meeting spot and not stopping either. So, uh, again, kind of the same same problems that we have are really getting that hook, um, but giving people multiple ways to give input, I think, is the most important thing, and we're definitely trying to do that. Awesome. Well, great. Well, I misled everyone because I do have one last question for you, but I think it'll, it's a good one. Um, would everybody mind just retelling us the the list of the survey and virtual meeting and mapping tools that you used, just so we can get those down? Sure, I'll start. I mean, uh, first first and foremost, the kind of the big the big wrapper of what a lot of our tools came in is part of ArcGIS ArcGIS Online. So, you know, that includes. Um, kind of the, the web mapping that was being shown in those story maps, the story map tool itself, Survey123, which is Esri's uh, survey program. Um, and uh, and then, so that's kind of the ArcGIS online package of products. Um, then for the, the meeting uh, hosting it, we, we Zoom, uh, we have a, an actual license for that uh, that we use for, for some of our public meetings where we want that facilitation tool. We used Google Jamboard, um, which is this little hidden gem of a, of a facilitation uh, program in, in kind of the G Suite, Google Suite of, of products. And then for those panoramic or the uh, the uh, photosphere is kind of the street view like 
um, views, that's a Memento 360, which is a cell phone app that you literally just kind of take photos and it stitches them together into that panorama. It hosts it, you're able to embed it in a website or in a story map or you know, WordPress, whatever you need to do for your website. Great, thank you. Uh, we, we just had um, Cognito Forms, um, uh, a small SLR and, and, a, and a camera and a uh, web and a phone, uh, the phone. And then I had Rodney Teague, who was a great editor, <laughs> who, was, who knew how to edit and make things uh, really tight and, and, and good. Excellent. Well, I think we have reached the end. So I just want to say thank you again once more to Heidi and Michael and Don for sharing their insights on public engagement. Um, there's a slide on the screen now that um, provides some federal virtual public involvement resources that might be useful. And I would presume that that'll be available to us after we close this session now. As a reminder, today's session does um, get you credit if, if you need it for the AICP CM credits. Um, so, so please make sure that um, if you're if you're in need of those credits, um, know that this session has satisfied that. Next up on our agenda is a short break, so um, feel free to take a little stretch and come back at 3:15 Eastern. There's two sessions running in concurrently, uh, so feel free to pick which one you want. Uh, but one focuses on continuity of operation plans, and the second on brownfield redevelopment. So, thank you guys so much, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>